Welcome to my channel, Midnight Stories, where you find horror stories that scare you. Before watching, please press like to support me in producing more stories. This helps in spreading the video and reaching more people. Thank you for your support and enjoy watching. I'm not convinced there is an afterlife or such a thing as ghosts or demons, but I once saw something in the woods that felt so unnatural, it made me second guess how I see the world. I was hiking up a hillside thick with trees in the middle of the night during a long weekend. Some friends and I decided we would hike to the top of the hill and light off some fireworks. Approaching the hill and surrounding the base of this hill was a rolling grass valley. It was around midnight, full moon plus light mist, straight out of a horror movie. Strange part was I wasn't nervous or scared or anything. I was having a great night with my buddies. I didn't have any of my defenses up. My buddies and I just hiked in a straight line through the rolling grass valley approaching the hill, when something caught my eye. On my right I saw a tall, shadowy figure standing perfectly upright on the top of small grassy hill. It was standing there right next to a large dead tree. I couldn't make out any details. Both the tree and the tall figure were silhouetted under the moonlight. The strange part was seeing this figure didn't scare me. I didn't immediate sense any threat. I almost assumed it might have been just another hiker or somebody having a smoke. I passively turned my flashlight on it, and that's when it happened. In an instant, as my light hit that spot where this figure was standing, it instantly moved just outside of the range of my flashlight, like it teleported or something. But just as vividly as I saw it standing in its initial spot, as my light hit that spot and the figure moved, I could see it standing just outside the range of my light. My breath paused. In an instant a wave of dread washed over me, something felt 100% unnatural about what just happened. As a reflex I moved my light to the new spot where the figure was, and as my light passed it, it disappeared. I've never passed out in my entire life, not from heat, not from getting knocked out, never. But in that moment I felt my knees give away from under me and I just fell to the ground. My friends turned and looked at my trying to pick myself up, and my knees were too wobbly to stand. They helped me and I tried explaining to them what I experienced. I'm willing to bet it was all just light shadows playing games with my eyes. But I'll never be able to explain that sensation I felt of feeling like I had just seen something I shouldn't have seen. Something so unnatural that my body's instinctual reaction to it was to go limp. I told this story to some friends tonight after not thinking about it for a while and remembered how odd and creepy it really is. I know so many of these stories are true, but the source of the story swears to God that what happens in the story is as close to his actual experience as possible. The man who told me about his terrifying experience in the Colorado wilderness is one of those distant relatives that everyone has. They're your third cousin, twice removed or something to that effect. I'm not positive how exactly we're related, but he's an incredible guy. I'll call him Greg. Greg is a decorated Green Beret with a silver star to his name that he earned by capturing the leader of an Afghan sniper cell without incurring any casualties. Despite his status as a huge badass and his not unconsiderable size, 6'3", approximately 200 pounds, Greg is a teddy bear, just an extremely humble, kind person. I have a lot of experience in the outdoors having lived in Colorado most of my life and Greg and I had an extended conversation about our adventures in the woods at my grandmother's house for Thanksgiving. We were sitting on the couch wearing tacky holiday sweaters when the conversation turned to hunting. Greg mentioned offhand that he used to be an avid hunter, but had an experience that turned him off to it. He said he doesn't even like guns anymore, something I found surprising coming from an accomplished soldier. I pushed him to tell me what happened and though he seemed uncomfortable with the idea, he finally did. I'm going to switch to first person now and try to write here exactly what Greg told me. It was late October, which means elk season up in the Indian Peaks wilderness, and I went up there to bag a few elk and just relax for a few days by myself. I parked the truck near a trailhead about eight miles from where I wound up setting up camp and was looking forward to a nice weekend in the woods with some peace and quiet after packing all my gear in and getting ready. The first morning, I was in my deer blind about twenty feet up a tree with a cup of coffee and my rifle, and the sun had just come up an hour or so ago. 
About fifty yards from my tree, the tree line ended and opened into this big meadow, where a lot of elk tended to roll through, and I could sight my rifle pretty well through the trees and see most of this big grassy area. Maybe a couple hours passed, which really isn't boring that deep in the woods. I just drank coffee from my thermos and listened to all the life around me, feeling the woods getting ready for winter. I couldn't believe my luck when I glanced over at the meadow and saw a large group of elk had started grazing in the meadow. The silent animals plodded along, munching at the grass, oblivious to me watching. Among the group was one of the most beautiful elk I had ever seen. It was what's called a monarch, which means its antlers had eight points each, something really rare. I quietly clicked the safety off my rifle and sighted it in. When you're hunting an animal like this, you want to put the bullet right where the skull meets the spine, in order to sever the spinal column and kill it instantly and painlessly. The focus when you get in the zone is incredible. I swear I could feel the firing pin punch forward and the bullet leave the barrel as I pulled the trigger. That beautiful elk went down silently and all the others scattered for the tree line. I was ecstatic about the shot and the elk as I climbed down out of the blind and set off for the meadow. I had left my rifle in my blind, something I regretted soon, and had only my small knife on me to gut the animal and drag it back to camp. As I was making the short walk between my blind and the meadow, I noticed that the woods around me were completely silent. Some of this is normal after you fire a gun in the woods, but for it to drag on this long was unsettling. I thought nothing of it and continued the short walk through the dense pines. As I was about to clear the trees and step into the meadow, I noticed something odd. I could see the elk's body lying in the grass through the trees, but there was something else there. There was what looked like another elk, antlers and all, on the opposite side of the dead elk from where I was coming to walk out of the tree line, almost looking as though it were gently nuzzling the other elk's dead body. This was weird to see an elk treat a dead elk like this. They usually just scatter, but I continued walking toward it, traipsing in the duff and hollering in an attempt to startle this other elk off. It snapped its head up and looked at me. Over the body of its fallen friend, this strange new elk eyed me with an unafraid glare. I say glare, because it didn't feel like an animal looking at me anymore. Its glassy black eyes gave me the same caught red-handed feeling that you got when your parents would catch you doing something wrong. I felt suddenly uncomfortable and out of place in the woods that I loved so much, and somehow hated and guilty. I no longer wanted the elk. I stopped dead in my tracks and watched this animal as it eyed me angrily. What it did next gives me nightmares to this day. It stood up, and it was not an elk. The thing that stood before me on the other side of the dead elk must have been lying on its stomach, and it put its arms down and pushed up, putting its legs under it. It reared back, glaring at me all along with its evil glass eyes. My breath caught in my throat. Most of its body was at least somewhat human, but terribly emaciated and elongated. It appeared to stand ten feet tall, not including the antlers atop the elk head. It was bald everywhere but the neck up, and looked sickly pale pink. Its legs, the knee bent backwards like the back legs of an elk. This horrible, skinny, naked, unnatural thing just stood there, glowering at me with a hatred that was palpable. The woods around us were silent. It might have been seconds, minutes, or hours. I felt the disapproving parent feeling shift. I felt more like an ant under a shoe. I took a step back. My boots felt ten pounds, my body felt numb, and the noise of my footstep was ear-splitting. I took one more and then turned and ran. Running through thick woods is tough, but I ran faster than I have in my life. I passed under my blind, with my dollar four thousand dollar rifle sitting in it, without even slowing down. I ran all the way back to my camp, which must have been a mile, before I stopped for breath. It took me another minute to dare to look behind me. I was alone, but the woods around me were still silent and brooding. I wanted more than anything to pack up and go home, but I knew I would not likely make it back to the car before nightfall, and I did not want to be exposed at night. I cooked an MRE in my tent and stayed in there the rest of the day. When night fell, I wrapped myself in my sleeping bag and tried to sleep but I couldn't stop myself from starting at every little noise. I kept thinking about possible rational explanations for what I saw. Maybe there's a crazy guy out here who found an elk head and is wearing it around scaring people. 
But no explanation I came up with quelled the maddening fear that I felt, that horrible sense of being hated and guilty and far from home, and nothing explained why that thing was ten feet tall with inverted knees. As soon as the sun came up, I ran back to the blind and took it down, then ran back to camp with my rifle and pack, packed everything up and hiked out. I've never fired a gun in the woods since, and I don't intend to ever again. I'm not a spiritual person, but if that wasn't something in the forest telling me to leave it alone, I don't know what is. I can take a hint. I don't think I'll ever know exactly what that creature was, but I know what I saw. Next time you're up in the woods alone, be quiet, be respectful, and don't kill anything you don't have to. I thought at first that Greg's story was too far-fetched to be true, but as he told it, I saw how truly scared he was. This confident, soft-spoken military man was stuttering through his story, hands shaking and face pale. I still don't know what to make of it, but the area he said this occurred is one I'm quite familiar with, and it can be an eerie place. I have had a few experiences solo camping up there, but nothing on this scale. Sometimes being alone in the woods can feel like anything but. It just might be that there's some force out there, some inhuman creature that guards the woods. Just in case, I take extra care to be respectful whenever I'm among nature. You never know what could be watching. I'm not a person who is scared easily. I don't let fear control me. I have had bullets whiz by my head. I have had rocket-propelled grenades explode less than ten yards from me. I know what it is like to jump from an airplane under gunfire. I know what it's like to live as if this was my last day on earth. Yet I was never afraid. I can only remember one time in my life where I could not control fear. One time where I truly felt uncontrollable fear. The fear that makes you cry and tremble. The fear that makes you lose control. No one but my best friend ever believed what I had experienced was true. My family didn't believe me. My now wife didn't believe me. I don't know if you would even believe me. I don't care. I'm past the point of not telling my story for fear that I won't be believed. Please understand that I grew up in the middle of nowhere. The closest people to me were my grandparents who lived just down the road from us and my best friend John's family who lived right next door. There were several other homes in the area within walking distance, but far enough apart that you really couldn't call them next-door neighbors. I learned to hunt, fish, shoot, and survived in the woods at an early age. My father had grown up in the country, moved to attend college, and met my mother. My mother was the opposite of my father. She grew up in the city. She taught me art, science, and how to cook. I had the best of both worlds growing up. I played multiple sports in high school, but decided to join the Army Reserve after I graduated. I graduated with honors from basic training in AIT and enrolled in a local college afterwards with plans to study computer engineering. At college, I entered ROTC. I graduated from college and completed BLC, Basic Officer Leaders course, for the Army. I returned home only to be deployed to Iraq where I served for a year. As a second lieutenant in Iraq, I was in charge of a platoon of soldiers. We were good at what we did and command took notice, putting us on missions and patrols that were most likely to see action. I loved it, but after a year the adrenaline had worn off, and the being shot at and seeing things explode feet from you began to fatigue my men and me. In the end, because we were good at what we did, we all went home, bruised, battered, and tired but alive to our loved ones. I had managed to keep up on my computer engineering skills while in Iraq and had landed a job with a company two hours from where I grew up. I came home in August and the job wasn't going to start till mid-January of the following year, so I had some time to relax and unwind. I was still living with my parents until the job started and fall meant one thing, hunting season, specifically bow season, which was something I missed the last two years because of my training and deployment. I eagerly unpacked my hunting clothes and gear from the attic where my mother had stored them and woke up early one September morning to head into the woods to scout for a hunting spot for that upcoming season. As I walked out the front door with my backpack full of gear on, I noticed John and his father standing in their backyard around the pen in which they kept chickens. John was bigger than me. 
He wasn't college educated, but he was good with his hands and worked in construction. He was living with his parents while he was building his own house in his free time on some land he bought a few miles away. Morning, I said as I lumbered with my gear to where they were standing. What's up, brother? John replied with a half-smile. Just heading out to do some scouting for bow season. I could see the pen door was open, and they were both looking at it inquisitively. John's dad was slowing, moving it back and forth, and playing with the latch as if to test the door itself. I don't know, John's dad said puzzled. The latch is too high for a raccoon, unless they climbed the wire fence and opened it. I've seen them do some crafty things and they are smart, replied John to his dad before turning to me. It's the second time in two weeks someone or something has gotten into the coop. Took a chicken last week and two last night. It might the damn town kids who ride their ATVs on the paths back in the woods all the time, or it might be raccoons. Either way, we're going to have to lock the pen with a padlock now. Town kids must be getting bored if they're stealing chickens, I stated with a sarcastic smirk. The local kids from the nearest town always played pranks or committed some minor act of vandalism or theft. Usually the result was broken mailboxes or some type of penis-shaped graffiti on a house or garage door. Nothing was so serious that it couldn't be fixed or cleaned up. Before I left to head into the woods, John had told me to scout out Crow Hill. He mentioned there had been a lot of deer activity up in that area, and that he would have put his tree stand there, except he got an offer from his girlfriend's dad to hunt their family farm. Crow Hill was a densely wooded hill about three-quarters of a mile from our houses. One half of the hill was covered in a thick pine forest, where murders of crows would occasionally hang out in noisy groups. The pines abruptly came to an end and opened up into a hardwood forest with fairly thick underbrush on the other half of the hill. The leaves had just started to fall, and the smell of the woods and crisp air excited me. The dust and sand of a rock paled in comparison to the crunch of leaves under my boots and cool air of my home. I had already seen several deer and deer signs by the time I reached the top of Crow Hill. As I came over the crest of the hill, a loud snort like a blast of air rang out. My senses heightened as I quickly scanned the area. Over the top of the underbrush I saw it. There it goes, there it goes, I thought to myself excitedly as I watched two pair of very large deer antlers glide over the top of the underbrush and disappear into the pine forest. I walked to the border of the pine forest where the deer had run. It was a meeting of two worlds. The hardwood forest had leaves, but the sunshine was bright and lit up the forest floor while the pine forest's trees blocked out almost all light, leaving the forest floor dark and mysterious. It was a little creepy to me, but I didn't care. There were deer tracks, antler rubs, droppings, and deer beds on the ground all around me. This was the spot. I turned in circles as I scanned for the perfect tree to attach my ladder stand to. Something to my left caught my eye as I spun. Ten yards away was a section of ground that looked like it had been purposely cleared of leaves in a circular fashion. Something was lying in the middle of the circle. With curiosity peaked, I walked over. What the hell? I was thinking out loud as my eyes tried to recognize what I was looking at. It was a house cat's body. But it had been dismembered. The limbs were strewn around in no organized fashion and it was missing its head. Only skin and bones were left. The cat had been there a while by the looks of it, but what confused me more than the position and condition of the cat were the odd markings around the body. Lines and circles surrounded the cat in an odd fashion. Damn kids, I thought to myself. The town kids had probably come across a cat that was probably killed by a coyote or bobcat and decided to make its corpse look spooky by drawing weird incoherent symbols in the dirt around its body. The empty beer bottle just outside the circle confirmed my theory. As much as the sight bothered me, the thought of deer hunting pushed any concern for the dead cat out of my mind. I brushed off the find and began looking for a tree again. I picked a large tree that was centered perfectly between the pine forest and the hill's edge I had just walked up. There was a bit of a clearing that ran from the tree to the hill's edge. I pulled my large bowie knife out of my backpack and began to clean out the clearing and around the base of the tree. I cut away as many small shrubs and branches as I could to make a clear path for me to walk. As I was almost finished the flapping of the wings, 
and the familiar squawking of a murder of crows flying overhead into the pine forest could be heard. Something had kicked them up. The hum and hiss of an ATV engine soon followed. It grew louder and passed. That's probably what scared them. I'm probably close to one of the paths that run behind the house. I made my way through the underbrush in the direction of where I heard the ATV. Only twenty yards from the tree I chose, I ran into a dirt ATV path. I cleared out a walkway from the tree to the path, marked it and my chosen tree with a ribbon, and followed the path back until I began to recognize the woods behind my house. It was the perfect setup. There was an easy path to follow, and I wouldn't have to worry about scaring any deer on my way to and from the tree stand. The next day, John and I took his four-wheeler up to the tree I had marked off, and we set up my ladder stand. I had since forgotten about the cat I had found the previous day. The seat and platform were about twenty-five feet off the ground, which was the perfect height. I could see everything from the ATV path behind me to the edge of the hill in front of me. I felt good about this spot, and I was ready to start hunting the beginning of bow season in the coming weeks. When bow season finally arrived a few weeks after I had everything set up, and I spent my days and evenings in the woods, I saw plenty of deer and even a few bucks that I considered shooters. I was holding out for those two bucks I had seen when I crossed over the hill that first day when scouting, though. One of those two monsters is what I was after. I always took my cell phone with me. It was kept on silent in case of an emergency. Strangely enough, because we lived near radio towers, I got good reception from my tree stand and would take pictures of the beautiful scenery around me or send texts to John mocking him about the size of the deer I was going to shoot compared to anything he was going to get on his girlfriend's farm. Angry birds also helped to pass the time when all the animals in the forest wanted to be still. The day, or night rather, that I felt real fear for the first time ever was on October 23rd. It was a cool day and overcast. It was perfect for hunting. I had some errands to run in the morning and had promised to help my father with some housework in the afternoon, which left only the evening for hunting. I was fine with that. It meant I got to hunt the twilight hour, or as hunters know it, the magic hour. It's that last hour before sunset where everything seems to get brighter before it becomes pitch black and all the animals are on the move. I was on my way back from running my errands when I pulled into the driveway and saw my father talking to one of our neighbors from down the road, Mr. Dawson. How are you, Mr. Dawson? I asked as I stepped out of my car. Oh, just fine. You're looking good and healthy, and I'm glad to see you home from that hellhole across the pond, he said with a smile. His black lab was with him obviously out for an evening walk. Jake was talking about someone taking his rabbits out of their pen, my dad started, and I mentioned that John's family recently had some chickens taken. Dawson chimed in immediately. I know it was them damn town kids because my lab went nuts last night barking up a storm. I threw on the floodlight and the rabbit pen was wide open. I opened my back door and could hear those shits running up through the woods. What the hell is wrong with kids in the town these days? I stated with disapproval. I guess you'll have to padlock you pens and cages like John and his dad did. Well, that's the thing, Mr. Dawson started. The rabbit pen is chained and locked. Whoever did this broke it clean off probably with a bolt cutter. Now I have to run into the hardware store and get a new chain and lock. That evening, with my backpack strapped to my back and my bow and arrows in hand, I headed out into the cool, crisp woods. As I was stepping into the woods, I could hear John's familiar voice call out to me. Hey, he shouted in a proud tone from his back porch. Got my deer this morning. When you get back from dicking around in the woods, you want to come over and have a beer? Yeah, I'll be over, right after I bag that monster that's up by my tree stand, I taunted back. It was a good twenty-five to thirty minutes walk to my tree stand. I was tired when I got to the stand, but my adrenaline kept me going. Like a ninja, I made my way through the brush to the tree ascended the ladder and pulled my backpack and bow up after me with a rope without making a sound. With my butt planted in the seat of my stand and my bow on its hook, I felt completely at peace. Beautiful nature surrounded me even on this overcast day. It was unimaginably better than the war-torn streets of Iraq. I pulled my phone from my backpack to check the time. 5.03 p.m. Perfect timing. The magic hour was going to start early because of the overcast day and excitement was flowing through my veins. Everything was perfect. 
The wind was in my face so deer coming over the hill or out of the pine forest wouldn't be able to smell me. Smaller animals were scampering across the ground headed to their burrows or nests for the night, and the faint hooting of an owl that had just awoken could be heard in the distance. 5.55 p.m. I put my phone away and let my eyes adjust to the dimming light. My adrenaline had kicked in harder as the thought of one of those two large bucks coming into shooting range raced through my mind like wildfire. I knew I would be walking home in the dark, so I brought a flashlight to guide my way. I double-checked to make sure I had packed it when I heard the crunching of leaves. My eyes opened wide and my ears perked up as I tried to quickly find the direction of the sound source. It wasn't a small animal. It was the distinct rhythmic sound of something heavier walking among the leaves. There, there it is. The noise is coming from over the hill's edge. I slowly pulled a pair of small binoculars from my backpack to see if I could get a better glimpse of what was coming over the hill. I can see it. It's a deer. My mind was racing. I couldn't tell if it was a buck or a doe, but I could definitely see the grayish-brown coloring of the fur of the distorted figure through the brush's branches. Ten more yards and I would have a clear view and a long shot at whatever it was. I strung the binoculars around my neck and got ready to stand up. It stopped as if it didn't want to come into the clearing at the edge of the hill. The light was dimming fast, and I as afraid I would not get a shot at a trophy buck, if that is what it was. The deer moved left into the brush. My heart sank to my feet. I began to relax and accept the fact that it wasn't going to come close enough for me to get a shot, until I realized it was moving closer, but through he brush on the left side of the clearing. I stood up and put my left hand on my bow. I only had about twenty minutes of light left and I wanted to make sure I made a clean shot. I could hear the deer thirty yards in front of me in the brush on the left side of the clearing. It was definitely in range of a clean shot. I couldn't see it, but I knew it was going to step out in the clearing. My heart was pounding. I could feel my body begin to sweat in excited anticipation. The excitement racing through my body stopped my senses from realizing the forest had fallen silent. I began to remove my bow from the hook when the deer began to move out into the clearing. What the fuck is that? From behind the bush appeared an arm, long, black, leathery, and with less than five fingers. It stretched out and planted its palm on the ground. A shock went up my spine. The hair on the back of my neck stood straight up. My body began to shake. My left hand fell to my side and my legs gave out underneath the weight of my body, causing me to silently thump back into my seat. I grabbed my binoculars and slowly lifted them back up to my face. I didn't want to make any jerk movements. I didn't want whatever it was to know where I was. Was this a person? I watched through my binoculars as the rest of the body of this thing emerged from behind the bushes. Its skin was leathery and its legs were very long. It looked human-like, but it wasn't human. It moved in a crouching fashion. I could see something in its left hand. It was holding something brown. The light was fading and I struggled to make my eyes adjust. It was a rabbit, not a wild rabbit. One like Mr. Dawson kept and raised. I could feel fear gripping me no matter how hard I fought it. I trained to fight and to hunt. I didn't know what this thing was or how I would be able to confront it. I sure as hell couldn't leave my tree stand now. That's when I smelled it. I had smelled it once before in Iraq. Burning flesh. The smell nauseated me. The air reeked with this creature's presence. My binoculars were fixated to my face. What is it doing? The creature meticulously cleared out the leaves around its feet in a circle. I watched in horror as it raised the rabbit above its head. Its eyes. Its eyes were yellow with no clear center or pupil. Its mouth contorted into a half-smile bearing a mouth full of deformed teeth. Its lower jaw unhinged and sank loosely below as it placed the rabbit's head in its mouth. Faster than a mousetrap, its bottom jaw shut and it jerked its head violently backwards, ripping the rabbit's head from its body. The snapping of bone sent a shiver up my spine. It grabbed the rabbit's back legs and held the lifeless body upside down. I watched in horror as blood flowed from the animal's corpse and splashed on the cleared ground. It shook the body up and down as if trying to empty it of every last bit of blood. Like a smoker with bad lungs, it seemed to giggle in a wheezing, airy fashion. My eyes welled with water. I couldn't fight it anymore. I was gripped with fear. I was crying. The military officer who had been shot at, almost blown up, 
jumped out of airplanes, was crying. It was almost dark, and I could just make out what this thing was doing. I slowly put the binoculars down and concentrated on not breathing hard or crying out loud in fear. Snap, snap, snap. I looked back at the creature. Each snap threw another shock of fear up my spine. It was dismembering the rabbit. Snap. The cracking of the bones made my body shiver. I watched as it purposefully placed each of the rabbit's body parts within the circle and drew random forms in the dirt around the dead body with its long, bony fingers. It lifted its hand and extended one of its fingers. I bit my lip almost to the point of bleeding to keep from making any sound as it scooped the entrails from the rabbit's chest cavity and placed them in its mouth. As the last bit of light left the sky, I realized I would be stuck in the tree stand unless this thing left. I should text John to come get me. No. What if it sees the glow from my phone's screen? What if he gets here and it kills him? My mind was racing faster than ever. I didn't once notice the wind change. To my horror, in the last bit of light the creature suddenly stopped what it was doing and became still. Tears were rolling down my cheek, my hair was on end, my hands were shaking and I could feel my body sweat. I didn't want to move. Suddenly, like a dog, it raised its head and began jerking it up and down. Shit, the wind has changed, it can smell me. It sniffed the air in three different directions with mighty snorts. All of a sudden it dropped low to the ground as if it were about to pounce. The wind was at my back. It knew I was there. Maybe not my exact location, but this thing knew I was there. The light completely faded as I watched it sneak back into the brush on the left side of the clearing. My heart pounded hard enough to cause a sharp pain in my chest. I wanted to cry aloud. I wanted to get my phone and call my friend, my parents, anyone who might be able to save me. There was no noise. The air was like a vacuum around me. I sat shaking in my stand. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Shit. It's coming toward me from the left. My ladder is on the left. God, what if it finds the ladder? I need to cut it down. The crunching was getting louder. The creature was close enough I could hear its incoherent rambling. It sounded like an old man struggling to breathe, fighting for his last breath. I reached into my backpack as fast and as quiet as I could and pulled out my knife. I stood up and turned to face the tree. It was dark. I couldn't see anything. I felt the bark of the tree above me desperately trying to find the cord that was holding the ladder to the tree. Asterisk, ting, asterisk. It's on the ladder. It's coming up the fucking ladder. Where's the cord? God, please. Here. I pulled hard. The knife cut through the cord with a snap of breaking bones. I pushed the ladder away from the tree. I could feel its weight on the ladder. With a boom that echoed throughout the forest, the ladder crashed to the ground with the weight of the creature. It let out a scream that pierced my ears and echoed everywhere. I covered my ears to shield myself from the horrific sound. I had never heard anything so horrible. The squeal of a hundred pigs mixed with a low roar pierced the night sky. I couldn't see it. I knew I pissed it off. I heard it scramble to its feet. I grabbed the tree to keep my balance. It's shaking the tree. It's trying to climb the tree. I could hear its fingers grasp the bark sinking its nails into the tree's flesh. There was only twenty-five between this thing and me. I grabbed my bow, pulled back, aimed straight down, and released one of my arrows directly below my stand. The arrow smacked the ground and the creature let out a scream louder than the previous. Pig screams. Thousands of pigs screaming pierced the air. At this point I couldn't hold back my fear. My breathing was audible and I was pouting like a small child. My pounding heart was about to break my sternum. My eyes were full of tears. It didn't matter. I couldn't see through the darkness anyway. I somehow fumbled another arrow from my quiver onto my bow. God, save me, please. Fuck off, I shouted, and released the arrow in the same exact spot as the previous. Again the arrow smacked into the ground, followed by a bellowing squeal. The tree stopped shaking. I could hear it on the ground its fingers digging into the leaves and dirt as it tore up the ground beneath it. The tearing came from beneath me. I struggled to put another arrow on my bowstring. The noise began to surround me as I fumbled along. It was to my right, now to my left, now below me, now behind me. The tearing was everywhere. No. Are there more of these things? I'm going to die. Did it call others? I pulled back my bow with my third arrow. The noise was everywhere. It sounded to my left. I guessed and shot in the dark. 
The ear-shattering noise and screams continued. I had one arrow left. I struggled to prep my last arrow. The noise surrounded me as if thousands of these things had encircled me. The squealing had intensified to the point where my ears were ringing. I drew back my bow and fired the last of my arrows directly beneath my stand. The squealing roar became unbearable as if I had hit it. I was out of arrows. I dropped my bow and slumped back in my seat. The noise was so intense I didn't even hear the bow hit the ground. I picked up my knife and held it tight to my chest. I could feel my body crashing from the immense adrenaline rush. Silence. I didn't notice the silence. My ears stopped ringing. Was it gone? The woods were still. All I could hear was the beating of my heart as it slowly came down from its frantic pace. The woods were silent and motionless. Whatever it was disappeared or was standing perfectly still. I could feel the last of my tears roll down my cheek. I couldn't smell it anymore. I couldn't smell anything. My nose was stuffed from my crying. I was still shaking and my body was exhausted. I should text or call someone to get me. No. If I pull out my phone, the screen light will give me away if that thing is still here. I had no idea what time it was. Absolute darkness engulfed me. The only thing that kept me from falling asleep from exhaustion was the thought of that thing being out there somewhere, watching me in the dark. Minutes passed. Hours passed. I was so tired, but I dare not fall asleep. A crunch of leaves every now and then caused me to grip my knife tightly. The woods remained silent otherwise. No creatures moving about. No owls hooting. No bats screeching among the treetops. Light. The first light peering over the horizon broke an eternity of darkness. I was able to start making out shapes and images. I looked down and saw my bow lying on the ground next to the ladder. The hair on my neck stood up again. My heart began to pound. My breathing became quick. All around the bottom of the tree I was in were symbols drawn in the dirt. The leaves were cleared for ten feet in a circle around the tree. All these weird symbols were drawn in the dirt where the leaves once laid. It was now or never. I grabbed my phone and texted John. He was the only one close enough that had a four-wheeler. It was day and I didn't see the creature, but there was no way I was going to stay in the woods another second, and I wasn't going to get down in case it was lying in wait under the brush. Me, John, I'm still at my tree stand. I need help. I waited. It was 7 a.m. Please, God, let him be up. John, dude, it's 7 a.m. What the fuck you still doing in your tree stand? He's up. Tears of joy began to well in my eyes as I fumbled quickly to reply. Me, come get me. Please hurry. John, Okay, okay, I'm OMW. I put my phone down. I was exhausted. I hadn't slept all night. The familiar rumble of John's ATV began to fill the air a few minutes later. What adrenaline I had left coursed through my veins. When John was close enough I could see him coming from the stand, I grabbed my backpack and jumped. Twenty feet straight down I descended. I hit the ground hard with a very audible thump. My left leg gave out from beneath me and I could feel the pain stream through my body as my ankle twisted. I spent no time lying on the ground. I fought through the pain, picked myself up, grabbed my bow and hobbled as fast as I could toward the ATV trail. The fear from the night before returned as I was running towards the trail. Now was the time I was most vulnerable. Now was the time the creature would strike. It was the perfect opportunity. The smell. The smell returned. The scent of burning flesh filled the air. John pulled up to the clear cut that led to my stand as I reached the ATV trail and jumped quickly on the back of his four-wheeler. Did you just jump from the stand? He said with a shocked voice. And what smells like hell up here? Fucking drive. Now. Okay. Okay. John spun the four-wheeler around and headed off towards our house. The feeling of fear wouldn't leave me. I slumped forward onto John's back out of exhaustion. I didn't have the strength to hold myself up. I only had enough strength to hang on to his jacket to keep from falling off. The motor of the four-wheeler covered my sobs of relief. Are you okay? John asked loudly as he navigated the trail. I didn't answer. I couldn't. I was too exhausted from the fear that had gripped me the entire night prior. The motor cut off and I looked up. We were outside my house. I hadn't stopped sobbing. I rolled off the back of the four-wheeler and laid in my yard sobbing. It's all I could do. Everything went black. I sat up rapidly and scanned my surroundings in a panic. My mother and father were there along with John telling me to calm down. 
The familiar softness of our couch on my body and smell of my mother's cooking filled the air. I was home. My ankle was wrapped with a bag of ice resting upon it. They gave me water to drink and questioned me about what had happened that night. I told them everything. As my story ended, I could see the disbelief in their eyes. My parents apologized to me for not checking up on where I was. They thought I had come home and gone out with friends or over to John's for a drink. John apologized the same and said he assumed I had come home tired and went to sleep. They tired to rationalize what I saw. They said it must have been an emaciated bear with mange. I knew better. I knew what I saw, what I went through. I didn't hunt the rest of the season and refused to enter the woods. John a few days later had kindly gone to my stand to retrieve it for me without prompt. He brought it over to my garage and met me with a puzzled look in his eye. So I found your stand, he started with an unbelieving tone in his voice. And it was on the ground. It's been beat up and the safety cables are busted off like someone had ripped it from the tree. Found your ladder too. He pointed to the white marks on the bottom rungs of the ladder. Those looked like claw marks to me. Found three of your arrows. You hit something because they are covered in some type of blood. Don't know what kind, but it smells like hell. He handed me my arrows covered in a reddish-black gooey crust. Also, the tree your stand was in. Bottom half of it has been stripped of bark and is smeared in what looks and smells like animal blood. All of those markings in the ground you talked about. Yeah, those are there, too. He slumped down on the edge of his four-wheeler as if in complete disbelief. I believe you. We didn't talk about it for a long time. We felt as if it were best to forget, never revisit or pursue. I eventually moved out of my parents' house to an apartment when my job started. The following summer, John called me with some interesting news. The missing animals continued infrequently throughout the spring. Mr. Dawson had become overly frustrated with whoever was stealing his rabbits. He set up a security cam to watch the pen and had purchased an industrial chain and lock to keep them out. One night his lab went nuts barking at something outside in the direction of the rabbit pen. Figuring he had them on camera and to teach them a lesson, he let his lab out to possibly scare them away. The dog ran out the open door and in the darkness seemed to be struggling with something. When Mr. Dawson turned on the floodlight, the chains on the rabbit pen were busted off and his dog was gone. Someone also destroyed his camera before it could capture the perpetrator on video. While I felt for Mr. Dawson, the strange part of our phone conversation had yet to come. The construction company John had worked for had secured a contract to build a new housing development on the side of Crow Hill, namely the side with the pines on it, as it was closest to the nearest road. It was to be an upper-middle-class housing development. John was part of the clearing crew who would go up and clear out the trees and underbrush of the designated area where the housing development would be built. John mentioned that he was clearing a small bottom where they were going to build a retention pond for irrigation when they came across something disturbing. The bottom was nestled at the base of Crow Hill and a neighboring hill. It was devoid of large trees, but rampant with small shrubs and heavy underbrush. As he and his crew cleared the bottom, they found what appeared to be pathways of bent grass and branches. They didn't look natural and were littered in small animal bones. As they cleared more and more, they came across what looked like a nest in the middle of the thicket. The grass and branches were bent over top of a bed of long grass like a makeshift dome. The outer part of the nest was void of grass and contained strange markings in the dirt. In the middle, on the supposed bed of grass, they found several strange items like broken locks, broken chains, blood-covered shreds of clothing, and a dog collar strapped through the top of what looked like a canine skull. John told me the tags had Mr. Dawson's name and address on them. He had returned them to Mr. Dawson, but didn't have the heart to tell him where he found them or in what condition. I could hear the slight trembling in John's throat. I knew he now believed me for sure. I went home several months later to see my parents. Our neighbor's animals had stopped disappearing. The housing development was about halfway finished. I was watching the news late that first night home. One of the headlines was Police on Lookout for Animal Kidnapper. Apparently several family pets had disappeared over the last few months in the next county over.
If you want to understand why I left the place I was at, you're really just going to have to hear the entire story. You won't believe it, of course. But your skepticism means nothing, because what I saw that night on the bayou has been with me ever since. In my mind, in my thoughts, and sometimes even in my dreams, it exists as a disturbing memory that I cannot shake away, that will never go away, just so long as I live. It will be one of those things so terrifying that it'll still be just as keen in my mind on my deathbed as it was the day it occurred. But whether or not you believe me, I'll tell it to you anyway. If not only to serve as a warning, a plea for caution, if you ever find yourself near the swamps late at night. At the time, I was working at a shitty little fast food place. The only thing worse than working at a shitty fast food place is working at a shitty fast food place on the night shift, by yourself, without a vehicle, especially when you just so happen to live in the heart of rural Louisiana. Such was my case some years ago, the night this event happened to me. During this time, I lived quite a few miles away from the restaurant I worked at, and due to my lack of a vehicle or any access to a public bus system, I was dependent on others for my transportation to and from work. One night, after a busy evening of serving customers, I closed the store and locked up the restaurant. When I phoned for my ride, nobody answered. Now, I'm not here to throw a pity party, but I can't help but to express anger at the fact that the person who drove me to and fro to work was my roommate, who had a car but no fucking job, and I was basically the only person in our house who paid the rent at this time. And this loser had the carelessness to fall asleep, leaving me with no fucking option but to walk again. This was not the first time that this had happened. The first time this had happened, it took me an hour and a half to get home, walking briskly. And to those of you who have never been to the rural regions of Louisiana, you have no clue. Here we have what is called a bayou. It's basically swamp. Thick, murky, moist, frog-laden, mosquito-swarming, gator-infested, crappy-smelling swamp, with thick tall grass, cattails, cypress trees, and heaves of pond scum. And I just so happened to live on the bayou, all the way down a long dirt road with hardly any street lights and thick swamp on both sides of the road. There are no side roads, and the houses down this street are separated sometimes by more than a quarter mile apart. It's not merely spooky walking down this road at night, it's fucking terrifying. You hear sounds, both real and imagined, coming from the bayou, Chirping, croaking, howling, grunting animals, the rustling of leaves and branches in the canopy of the cypress trees, and the splashing water from underneath them. That's the worst. You can hear the sound of something lurking nearby, abruptly dunk underwater. It can be a turtle, a snake, or an alligator. You never know. You just keep walking, with your teeth and hands clenched tight, hoping nothing crawls through the tall grass next to you and onto the road or even worse than the subtle dunking sounds, the sudden splashes that happen when you're walking and scare a toad or frog, and it jumps into the water. The sound makes you almost shit yourself as you begin a running spree that lasts about three seconds before you realize what it was, and then you're left with your heart pounding so hard that the sound of your blood gushing in your temples scares you just as much. These are the types of things that happen when you're in the bayou. This is what I had to look forward to that night as my asshole roommate slept sprawled out on the sofa with the television set probably tuned into reruns of The Three Stooges and The Marx Brothers. And don't get the impression that I simply called once and gave up. You can trust that his cell had around seven or so missed calls, three very unfriendly voicemails, and several aggressive text messages. I could just imagine his phone laying in another room of the house, softly vibrating in my desperate attempts to reach him as he snored. But eventually I gave up, and having just about no other friends to contact in the area as a recourse, I stopped by the nearby gas station, grabbed an energy drink, and began my ways back home. Now you must understand, the first thirty or so minutes of my walk isn't that bad. I'm still in the most populated part of town, and there are street lights, stores, houses and cars passing by in large numbers. That's important. If there are a lot of cars going by, you feel safer than when there are very few cars going by. Because when there are only one or two cars that pass you every three minutes, that means that there could be a psychopath in one of those cars, and they may have enough time to stop by and murder you without being caught. But if there are a lot of cars around, 
There may be psychopaths passing by, but they'll most likely not kill you then because there are too many people around to witness the crime. At least that's my reasoning. I digress. No psychopaths pulled up next to me as I walked about this part of town. Next there comes a time in my journey where I have to turn down several suburban neighborhoods and walk some streets to get where I am going. And here's where things get a little less safe, and I have to be a little more cautious. There's less traffic down these roads and you never know when some punk or gang may be hanging out in some empty lot or house who might mess with you or try to pick a fight or mug you or just take an empty bottle of malt liquor and bash your skull in, you know, as an initiation ritual or something. These are the thoughts that go through my head as I walk this region, and they keep me on my toes, until I reach the point where houses become fewer and fewer, and the bayou begins. This is where the dirt road leading to my home is, and that's where I found myself this night, on foot. I look down the narrow road. You can only see so far before it fades into misty darkness. I resented that I would have to spend the next hour walking its distance until I reached home, but anger took hold of fear when I thought about how all of this could be spared, if not for the neglect and carelessness of my roommate. When I got home I was really going to have it in for him. I truly considered at that time the possibility of physically smacking his damned face. And with this thought in mind I launched defiantly down the road, and the further I walked the darker it became, until no light shined but the stars and a sliver of the moon above me. Very soon the sound of any vehicle was completely non-existent. There was just me, the road, and the bayou, and whatever creatures dwelt there. I heard the crickets chirp and the frogs croak and the occasional bird coo. To avoid fear, I focused on their chorus and let their sounds preoccupy my mind. I walked watching my shoes press into the sandy dirt as I placed one foot in front of the other. I would count my steps until I reached one hundred, and then I'd begin again. I tried to lose myself in the repetition. My shoes became damper and damper, and I felt the soles of my feet become moist. I stopped counting to ponder whether I should smack my roommate with a wet sock, but my thought was interrupted when I glanced up for a moment and saw that I was not alone on this road. A sharp panic seized my heart and I became very nervous. A long distance up ahead of me I could discern the soft silhouette of a figure. It was so far away that I couldn't tell whether it was moving ahead or in my direction. I froze and I could feel the blood gushing in my temples. What were the chances of there being some malicious punk wandering this street at night looking to rob me or pick a fight? This was the reassuring thought I had as I tried to convince myself that I was safe. I tried to keep calm, to not let my nerves get the best of me. I mean, whoever this was was probably just as frightened of the prospects of me as I was of them. If they had already detected me, that is, I didn't know what to do. Run? There was only two directions. Continue walking. What were the risks? As I stood there, I saw that the figure was indeed moving in my direction, and its form was becoming more defined. And this was the time I began to notice how awkward it was moving. The figure didn't walk normal. It didn't bob up and down like how a normal person looks like as they walk. What was coming towards me, it would seem from my perspective, moved in short, quick, jerking movements, and I could see from what light was present how its twitchy limbs projected from its torso, and how it was getting closer, and how its head stuck out from a neck that was longer than any human neck should be, and how at this time I could now faintly hear the noises that it seemed to make, the sound of suckling, and how it was moving quicker, and how its face lifted and I could see its eyes glare like glowing yellow beads, and how these wide, beady eyes locked onto mine, staring at me, and how it stopped, and how we both were there, motionless, yards away, looking at each other, and how it then let out the most ungodly, inhuman screech I have ever heard, like a pig being gutted. It squealed violently, and the sound resounded through the bayou, and the chirping and croaking of crickets and frogs stopped. Everything stopped, and the rumbling and humming was all that could be heard afterwards. The rumbling and humming of a motor ahead, a vehicle speeding towards us, tires racing loudly. The thing in front of me hunched over and turned to see the headlights beaming our way. It hissed, getting down on all fours, only pausing for a moment to turn back towards me, gawking at me with its wide eyes, before crawling hastily into the swamp. 
The vehicle that scared the thing away was my roommate's car. He never saw it, whatever it was, and I never wanted to see it again. I moved as soon as I could and haven't been there since. I've been hiking parts of the Appalachian Trail for about 15 years, successfully through hiked at Nobo in 2020, from Georgia to Maine for any readers not familiar with the jargon, and would humbly consider myself an all-around seasoned hiker. I've spent hours searching online, spoken to hiking friends, burned through books at the library, and have simply come up short. I'm writing this post because I've never experienced anything like what happened the last few times I've been on the trail and need to know if anyone knows what the hell this is. It started happening about two months ago on a weekend backpacking trip. I left right from work, so I got a bit of a late start, but I work pretty close to a trailhead that takes me up to a nice, more remote section of the trail. I'm just going to start from the beginning, specific details and all, about each day I've been on the trail. Hopefully I overlooked something that makes this make sense. Night one, I teach high school history and the students were especially checked out on this Friday afternoon. I can't blame them. It had been a long week. I was eager to finish the day and get out on the trail, too. The long hand on my classroom's analog clock slogged its way to the twelve as I wrapped up a lecture for my honors U.S. history class. So, President Taft's choice to replace Roosevelt's appointed Secretary of Interior really drove this wedge between them. Some saw this as a clear sign that Taft had abandoned the conservation movement. The overwhelming majority of the class were buried in their phones, likely on Snapchat or whatever social media is popular now, probably talking about weekend plans. Well, that will do it for today. Don't forget the quiz Monday. Have a good weekend. The bell rang and the class cleared out quickly as the hallways began to bustle with student traffic. I waited an obligatory five minutes before making my own way out but was caught by a co-worker, one of the new hires this year. Hey, Alex. This week was a tough one. Want to grab a beer? Joe was a nice enough guy. A little weird, but he meant well. He was a little quirky and socially awkward, but it's rare to find other teachers who fit the bill as normal. Hey, Joe. Sorry, got a pass this time. I've got a camping trip planned. Oh, really? Where to? I'll be on the Appalachian Trail for two nights. Oh, well, I hope you know the rules of Appalachia. He said this with a grin as I stifled an eye roll. Yes, I had heard of the silly rules. I decided to be nice and entertain him. Feigning genuine curiosity, I asked, What are the rules, Joe? Well, there's three main ones, a bit of debate about a few others, but here it goes. One, don't leave the path. Two, don't go into the woods at night. Three, if you think you heard your name, you didn't. Kind of spooky, right? Wow, I'll be sure to keep those in mind. Ah ha ha, well, I'll let you go. We should hike together sometime. As I began to step away, I smiled and got out a quick, sure, that'd be nice. I typically prefer hiking alone. Something about the quiet and single-minded focus on the task at hand always felt meditative to me. I already began to feel the stress-relieving effects of the solitude on the heavily wooded drive-up. After driving for about forty-five minutes, the narrow country road leading to the trailhead came into view. I turned and found a small, empty dirt parking lot accompanied by a singular post marking the trail entrance. It was mid-fall and a little chilly, so I didn't expect to see too many others on the trail. I tied up my hiking boots, got my pack on, and made a quick mental check of all the essentials. Tent, food bag, buck knife, light source, water filter, stove, book, etc. It was time to start on the trail. The first hour of the hike was uneventful. The path was deserted, not a single other hiker in sight. Most of the leaves had fallen from all of the trees as the forest transitioned to winter. The route was a little uphill and a bit rocky, but nothing unexpected. Pennsylvania has a reputation for being one of the rockiest sections of the Appalachian, sometimes mockingly called Rocksylvania. I only have about another hour of hiking before I reach the spot I planned on setting up camp at when I started to hear a faint smacking sound deep out to the left side of the trail. It was clearly quite far away, but it sounded as if someone were smacking tree branches together. I really didn't think anything of it. Things made noise in the woods, trees fell, deer moved around. It only became strange when I realized the noise was changing as I progressed along the trail. 
For about ten minutes I heard periodic spurts of three smacks in a row. This might suggest to the reader that it was a firearm of some sort. I'm familiar with quite a few different guns, and none that I know of sound like this at a distance. I barely noticed on a conscious level, but the number of successive smacks had increased to four. I only seriously noticed the transitioning of the smacks after about thirty total minutes of hiking, when it was now up to five. Whack, 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 whack. I stopped, only just now consciously processing the full strangeness of the noise. I peered off, focusing my gaze as far as I could, towards the direction of the faint smacking. I heard it again, still five smacks, whack, 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 still faint and distant. An idea flashed into my head, and I quickly turned back on the trail and retraced my steps for about twenty paces. I stopped again and waited, until whack, 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 only four again. In my view, there were two possible explanations. One. The fifth smack was inaudibly obscured by something on the previous ten minutes of the trail. However, if that were true, the sound would likely be getting louder, and it was still as faint as when I first heard it. 2. Whatever was making this noise was reacting to my movement and progress along the trail, increasing the number of whacks the further along I hiked. I decided to move on and put the sound out of my mind. Whatever it was, it was far away, too far to see. Didn't seem likely that it could see me then, either. The smacks moved back up to spurts of five as I caught up to where I had turned back on the trail. After an additional ten minutes I half expected to hear spurts of six, but the smacking had completely stopped almost exactly as ten minutes had passed. I walked for about three minutes more before I saw something. A tiny little square hung from a piece of string tied to a branch. The square dangled right in the center of the trail, about five feet off the ground. I stared at it for a moment, unsure of what it was. I reached out and felt the square to discover it was just folded up paper. I slowly removed the paper and began unfolding it carefully. I had heard of people leaving cryptic messages folded up, hanging from trees in the woods before. It sounds creepy, but it's kind of common in parts of PA. They call them skeel kill notes, if you're so inclined to look into those. Skyle kill notes typically contain jumbled up cryptic messages about secret societies, the Illuminati, aliens, or anything that might attract conspiracy theorists. The single word on this note, however, left a much more chilling impression. Alex, I was genuinely scared now. My mind raced, thinking back to Joe's comment about the rules and names. I felt stupid getting so paranoid on the trail, but I was alone. The sun was going down and I had about two hours of hiking between me and my car. I practically ran the remainder of the distance to the shelter where I planned to set up camp. The Appalachian Trail has a bunch of bare bone shelters where anyone can sleep, or in my case, camp next to. When I arrived at the nearest shelter, I stopped and caught my breath. I kept reminding myself that things make noise in the woods and that people have been known to leave weird notes around the woods in this region. The name was a coincidence, it had to be. My name was fairly common. I started to focus on the task of pitching my tent, setting up my sleeping pad, and getting ready for the night as the sun vanished. I couldn't shake the unsettling feeling. I honestly would have turned around and gone back to my car if I could have, but it would be seriously dangerous to hike for two hours over rocky downhill terrain in the dark. I laid in my tent, reading by the light of my LED lantern. I skipped cooking dinner that night and just settled for some jerky and a cliff bar. My tent provided a false sense of security against whatever was outside, but false security was preferable to none. I eventually drifted off to a light sleep. Unfortunately, it didn't last long. Something big was brushing against the outside of my tent. My food was tucked away in the bear box offered by the shelter, so whatever it was couldn't be after my food. One's mind frequently goes to bear in such situations as a worst-case scenario slash horrifying situation. A black bear seemed like more of a best-case scenario at this point. They were harmless for the most part, so long as you didn't get in between a mother and her cub. Some irrational part of me hoped that unzipping my tent and revealing the culprit to be a black bear looking for trash would somehow explain the odd happenings of the day and finally make things make sense. I was surprised at myself as I cautiously unzipped the entrance to my tent and readied the lantern to peer outside. It wasn't a black bear. 
Standing about five feet from my tent was what appeared to be a deer. The deer was, disturbingly, standing on its hind legs, only slightly hunched over while its front legs bent and its hooves dangled. Its body was riddled with fleas and ticks. I could count at least eight of them ready to burst from gorging on the deer's blood. Most off-putting was the deer's face, which seemed to be contorted into an attempt at a smile, revealing rows of overlapping teeth. I felt for my buck knife and waited. The deer exhaled briskly out of his nose, breath visible in the October air. Once the deer inhaled, filling up its corrupted body with oxygen, the distorted animal slowly turned around and ran away, the entire time remaining on its hind legs. I zipped up the tent, kept the lantern on, and clutched my knife tightly. I wouldn't be getting much sleep that night. Which country are you following me from? I love to know more about you and your cultures. I love reading your comments and sharing. What is the best horror story that scared you in your life? Was it a real or fictional story? I love challenging myself and creating new and exciting stories. What do you suggest for me in the next stories? Do you want stories about ghosts or vampires or zombies? Leave a comment even if it's a letter.